When I came out in the early 90s, I think this stigma of being 30, you're dead in the gay scene was very much there. Uh, I don't think it is now. I'm still going to go out clubbing when I can and uh, have some fun because I can. I'm a single gay man. Uh, And I think that's the beauty of being gay is because we can do that. You know, I think when you're straight, it's expected that you you settle down and you have kids and you don't do that. But, you know, I I don't have any of that shit. So I'm going to carry on partying until I, until I drop. Hello, I am Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. Bernie Hodges is a voice artist, actor, and the co-host of the What That Old Queen podcast. Moving to Bristol in the early 90s with a few mates when he was just 21 years old, He quickly built a life for himself, but struggled to find his tribe and that sense of belonging that comes with that. But that all changed when he started to go to horseplay, a night that billed itself as an underground homo disco, which started in 2011. We caught up to talk about leather harnesses, what it really means to be an A-gay, and death by Dildo. The thing is, is I was quite religious when I was growing up as a teenager, which is probably one of the reasons why I suppressed it so much. So, um, and I came to the conclusion that if God didn't want me to be gay, wouldn't have made me like this, because it's not a choice. <laughs> so he wouldn't have made those butts so perky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he wouldn't have made me so cute. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not particularly religious now. I mean, that was just a big kind of learning curve for me as well back then. Um, but um, I, yeah, I decided that I was going to come out. I was going to be gay, and um, kind of eyed one of the campus-looking, very very good-looking, but quite obviously gay men in Bristol, and kind of stalked him until he dated me, and he was my first boyfriend, and I came out. Okay, okay. So wait, I've got I've got lots of follow-up questions. So the friends that you moved with they were good friends in kent but you just kind of drifted apart when you got to bristol well they weren't that good friends you know we uh, we would go out to the pub together they were kind of acquaintances really we didn't really know each other that well they knew each other quite well so hang on so they just wanted a free ride uh well i think i don't I think they jokingly asked me and they didn't expect me to say yes. (laughs) (laughs) But I did. Oh, shit, now I'm going to have to get a (laughs) (laughs) three-bed. So, um, and we were very different beasts. Uh, uh, Like I say, I think I had a different agenda. I mean, they're straight, so, and I'm gay. Uh, And obviously, I I had a very different uh, kind of remit I guess, because uh, I was on this... Well, the gay agenda, yeah. Yeah, the gay agenda. I was (laughs) asked to come out. (laughs) So we weren't particularly going to the same places. And uh, uh, there's no real, like, way of me saying this without sounding like a total dick, so apologies to everyone. But, like, if you were in this point where you were about to come out like okay so what happens a lot of times is when someone is about to come out they're like i'm only really interested in masculine men i only really want men who are real men i'm not a fairy i'm not this i'm not this so why did you pursue this very effeminate man he was he wasn't effeminate uh he was just obviously gay oh i see um he was very flamboyant but also very good looking 
Yeah, um, and I I found him really attractive, but I don't think my gay dad was that great back then. So I probably, if someone was like, uh, if they weren't presenting as being gay, I probably wouldn't have thought that they were. And also, you got to remember, I was really naive back then, so I didn't. <laughs> But there wasn't much gay dog going on. So I had to go for someone who was really obviously gay. <laughs> and amazingly so. And yeah. Oh, yeah. And sorry, I, I really don't mean to see to sound as though I'm putting um, overtly gay people down. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. But... Um, so how did you find, like, how did you find this man? So back in the day, everyone used to go to the watershed. Uh, They still do. It's still there. The bar hasn't changed in 30 years, which is a media centre in Bristol. Um, But because um, it's it's an art centre, media centre, so it used to get a lot of gay clientele. And it used to be the place to go um, before you went out to the gay bars and gay clubs on a Friday, Saturday night. Um. I picked up on this because obviously I would go there with straight friends. And, and the gay uh, went so off, I, yeah. So the gay, the gay <laughs> <doll> went off. <laughs> also, I was working with a guy called, uh, well, I'll change the name. So, it's, not, <laughs> not but I was working with a gay guy. He was an obvious, he was a, we used to call them clones back then. So he had like a shaved head and a mustache. And I can't, I came out to him. Well, I told him I was bisexual, um, which is obviously a lie. So, <laughs> but how, you know, it's trying to ease yourself and everyone else into, you know, coming out as a gay man. And um, he took me to my first gay club uh, on a drinks night after work. We would, we would go out for drinks, at, like, after work, during the week, at the weekends, whenever. Uh, and that's when I first saw my first boyfriend. And then I found out that he worked behind the bar at the watershed. So at some point in the evening on a Saturday night after drinks, after work, and I was uh, drunk enough and to be brave enough, I'd wander down to the watershed on my own and spend the rest of the evening trying to get served by him. And so when you say try... <laughs> well, I, I did get okay. served by him every single time. <laughs> And then, like, were you able to walk home, or <laughs> were you just ordering so many drinks so you could talk to him? And then I would walk home on my own and cry. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I, didn't. <laughs> I mean, that, that there were other nights for that, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, we went to a, a club which was called Vadim's, which was up on the Triangle, and um, I used to go there to try and meet him. And uh, it didn't happen very often. I mean, I didn't bump into him very often. But there was one night I I literally just went out on my own and I decided to go to Vadim's first. And uh, I'd met some of, uh, an acquaintance, just ended up chatting to them most of the evening. And then at some point, Mark came into the club and I was feeling very brave. So I just went up to him and started talking and we danced and snogged and shagged and then dated. <gasps> that was it. So do you remember what your pickup line was? No. <laughs> is that is that no genuine or are you just saying no because it's so embarrassing? I literally don't okay. know what no. I said to him. Okay. I, th- I think we'd met before. Uh, I, th- I think I must have gone up to him and said, oh, you're Mark, aren't you? You, know, you work at the watershed. <laughs> and... Strung up a conversation from that. <laughs> um, so he was your first boyfriend? Yes. Uh, and he kind of introduced me to the gay scene. So w- back then, I was a real indie kid. So I was into um, the Smiths, Ride. Um, so really gay bands. <laughs> Yeah, well, 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 in hindsight, there were, you know, a lot of gay guys liked those bands. I just didn't know that they did. uh, And I didn't know they were gay. Um, And so I was in that kind of indie kid kind of realm. And I think when I came out, uh, Mark was very, very sceny. And there was a there was a certain look. And I kind of 
I changed who I was because I thought, okay, I'm gay now, so I need to fit into this this gay crowd. Mm. And and I do. I mean, I've always liked different kinds of music, and uh, but I was I was a really indie kid. But then it kind of made me express my kind of pop and disco. Yeah, that all came out um, as well. It's a total head fuck though, isn't it? Like that whole like, oh, okay, so that's what a gay man looks like. Then <laughs> therefore I should start doing this and start listening to this and start doing this. And then like yeah. you kind of keep it going for a few months. And then after a while you're like, what? what's going on? Who am I? Yeah, who am I? Um, but I think that happened for a long time. Because uh, I wasn't, I actually wasn't that comfortable with being gay. I don't think until my early thirties. Oh, really? Yeah, I I had I had massive hang. I mean, it was a bit of a serial monogamist. So I dated Mark for a year, my first boyfriend, and uh, and then moved on to someone else quite quickly. I think we split up, and then within a few months, I'd moved on to someone else. I dated them for a couple of years, moved in with them while I was at university. Uh, that was a nightmare relationship. <laughs> wait, 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 are we moving on? Are we just, are we, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm just, I'm getting a <laughs> Line underneath. Uh, well, I mean, how long do you want to <laughs> How long is your episode? It's going to um, be like yeah, Warren. Um, if I go through all my many, many successful relationships, we're going to be here all night. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, I should let you know now I'm not trained at this. So, <laughs> so yeah. if I rip any I, band aids off, then you're on yeah. your own. <laughs> yeah, we're not. This isn't therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and then, yeah, just went on a series of, uh, uh, and I used to go out occasionally, but I was I was kind of stuck in these relationships, which ended up being uh, monogamous and us living together, and then I suddenly got to the the end of um, my twenties. And I really didn't know who I was because I was I was living for these relationships, and I thought that's what you did. And so, were you were you one of those people that kind of assimilates into a relationship? So mm. you lose part yeah. of yourself. Yeah, the the relationship was more important than I was, mm. and consequently, that was making me really unhappy. But it wasn't necessarily the relationship's fault; it was my fault. It was because I wasn't making myself happy. And I can look back and realize that now. But at the time, I used to blame the relationship. Mm -mm. And so consequently, I would end the relationship because I thought it wasn't making me happy. Um, but it, actually, it was the fact that I wasn't fulfilling myself and doing the things that I wanted to do, which I could have, looking back, I could have done within those relationships, but I didn't. Well, then you wouldn't have been in your 20s. Oh, but yeah. And also, I didn't know how to. It was like, I didn't know. Mm how to do that or that or whether that was the thing that i needed to do you know again at the time i was uh still finding myself as as a gay man i don't think i was very nice because i would go out in because i was in a relationship which was monogamous if guys would come on to me i would give them short shrift <laughs> shall shall we role play <laughs> I don't think you want no, to. No, 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 no. Okay, let's. So, okay, here. I'm walking up to you at the bar. Hey, how are you mm. doing? Fuck off. Oh, oh, is that it? <laughs> Pretty oh, much. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I would be I would be polite to a point, but if they would become too persistent, I would end up just telling them to F off, really. But, and, and so, like, would you go out with your boyfriend? No. Okay. No. Wait, why why do you say it like that? Well, again, this is the dysfunctionality of our relationships. Because <laughs> it, it was like that the relationship was what I had at home, uh, but going out was something completely different. Hmm. Yeah. But there was still a commitment to monogamy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Do I ask follow-up questions? Well, but back then, you didn't have open relationships. Yeah, but that wasn't a word, was it? So it was, it was uh, an indiscretion. There were, there were a number of indiscretions <laughs> that went on. Um, but you've just told me to fuck off. So, so how know. do you... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, what is my problem? I was just... Let's just say I was fucked up. <laughs> so, 
So was it like a hate fuck kind of thing? Like you'd be so mean to them that like you'd get off on it? No, I, to, to be honest, I didn't sleep with many people. Uh, I used to flirt with the idea. Uh, I, there were occasionally, um, if I fancied someone and they come on to me, we I would snog them, and maybe now and again, I would sleep with them. But but it, it just wasn't. You were either single or you were in a relationship. No one talked about open relationships or polyamory. Okay, so so when you talk about being in like you know these a serial monogamous, that wasn't because you had this uh, heteronormative idea of what a relationship would be, and you were fixated on that. It was just because that was the norm. That was the norm. Okay, yeah, Uh, and and probably the same thing that I I had an idea in my head that it was that. But then I but but then in my late thirties, I I decided to live on my own because I I I decided. I need to, you know, I need to shag around. I've never done this. I've, I've spent the whole of my 20s in relationships. Uh, and while I've had a little bit of fun here and there, I haven't had a lot of fun. Um, so I ended up getting in with some friends who were very, very sceny gays. And I used to go out on the scene with them, uh, which was really fun. But again, I didn't feel like it. I kind of fitted that um, and so these were kind of clubs with like top 40 music. <laughs> I sound so old when I say that. What is top 40? Um, like, you know, with like commercial dance music and disco yeah. and stuff. Like the, the your generic kind of gay. Yeah. What you would imagine. Bars and clubs. Yeah. Uh, so there was nothing kind of underground or alternative about them. And then uh, <laughs> I had a couple, a couple more kind of relationships. <laughs> in my 30s but up until my mid 30s when uh i've been single ever since so uh apart from the odd one year affair here and there but what happened when i was single i decided to concentrate on myself when i was 30 i hated myself i was like i've not done anything that i wanted to do with my life so by the time i was 40 i really loved myself because i was doing everything that i wanted to do so um, I I started off my 30s by being a wedding singer and performing. And from that, I got into doing some more radio because I met someone who was doing radio stuff. Uh, and I started writing an audio sitcom with them. Then I decided to do an a- acting for radio course because we were writing this audio sitcom. Realised how much I loved acting. Uh, and then did a two-year refresher course for acting. And then was doing theatre and film, little bits of TV, uh, got involved with people who were making um, micro-budget queer films in Bristol. So I made a series of those with them, which I ended up producing and casting as well as being in. And um, and so by the time I was 40, it was really kind of fulfilled. And off the back of that, I suddenly decided that I was quite successful Uh, or I was on a trajectory for being quite successful. So um, I used to go to this thing. Do you remember Jake in London? It used to be like a posh puffs kind of night where you go and... a networking thing? Okay. Yes, yeah. So they had a little offshoot in Bristol at Goldbrick House, which I went along to and met some some very nice people. Uh, And I used to wear like a, a suit and, you know, or a suit jacket and go along and... Uh, and think, oh yeah, this is this is my scene now. You know, I'm kind of uh, getting older. I'm successful. Wait, I'm earning and, a little bit. And of did money. you ever use the term a gay? No, no. Someone's called <sighs> me an a gay before. Well, because well, so what happened was um, Jake turned into Village Drinks, who then wanted to start charging everyone. And what uh, I and a couple of others decided to take it over, and we created this night called Members which was for professional, in inverted commas, gay men. And uh, and I ran it with another guy for, for three years, and then I did four years on my own. And after seven years, I realised I'm not a professional gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not. Oh. <laughs> so again, I hadn't quite found my tribe. But in parallel with that was horseplay, which I've only realised this, but I ended up going to the first night of horseplay. I thought I'd stumbled on it after it had been around for a few months. But actually, 
I went to the first night because yeah. I remember one of the guest DJs and he only ever played one night and I was there when he played. Um, every, so if I t- used to tell my friends that I was going to horseplay, everybody thought it was a kinky night. <laughs> well, I have to admit that that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> well there's been kind of uh leather themed nights where, which was a ball um but uh no it was just like an underground uh underground homo disco that's what they used to call it and it was um used to be uh once a month at the cavern club in bristol which is like uh a lot of the kind of venues in the center of bristol particularly the old city have like these basements which have all these archways uh-huh. and stuff and this was one of those and you you i would go I, I would have to get drunk beforehand because i was always going on my own so i'd have to have a bit of dutch courage to go down there and uh and then i'd, I'd you know stumble down the stairs and um actually see lots of people that i know uh or you know acquaintance on the scene who i've i've known for different things and um and then you know have a have a dance and a snog and if i'm I'm lucky so why were you going on your own because none of my friends wanted to go with me at that time (laughs) and why is that because i think they didn't i think they were intimidated by it and because they thought it was something, um, they thought it was a, like a, a fetish night, and it wasn't. It was, it was actually a really lovely community of people, uh, and I ended up finding some really lovely friends who are still part of my friendship group now. In fact, all the all the guys that created Horseplay and run it are all very dear friends of mine now. And um, and I think what I liked about it was because it was playing music that I liked. It wasn't the ch- you know, speeded up remixes of, of chart stuff. It was actually really nice electro dance music and classic stuff. Uh, it was uh, a little bit more edgy, a little bit more alternative. And it wasn't guys in tight white shirts. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and I have a few tight white shirts <laughs> myself. Um, but it was I. I'd come from a scene which where I was going going out on that scene, and it was all about that. Or I was doing members, and it was about mm. suits and, and being a professional gay. Were and I didn't feel like I fitted in there at all. Whereas suddenly I'm in this club. Where, which is smoky and I can smell poppers and they're playing all the music that I love. And um, it just seemed so much fun. And I felt like I haven't had any... F- well, I had, I've had some fun, obviously, but I've, it just... I felt like I hadn't had fun in ages. I was trying to be something else. And actually, I, I, I went there and I just thought, yes, th- this, this is who I am. This is what I love. Uh, and this is what I like. Uh, and so it was it almost felt like it was just a little, the last brick to go in place of the, the Bernie gaydom, as it were. He's a whole gay now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so so when, you know, when there's a, a, like a, a night that's once a month and it's like it, it becomes mm. your life, did did your whole social calendar revolve around when a horseplay was going to be on a little bit not at the beginning uh i used to used to try and go along and also obviously i was going i was going along on my own and i didn't know very many people uh and i wasn't that close to people that were going there but consequently because i was running members and we were putting on parties with um uh uh female counterpart called indigo and uh we would invite guest djs to come in uh and i would obviously reach out to the djs of horseplay and uh because they ended up being part of these bigger parties that we would put on 
I consequently got to know them better and I got to know that circle of friends better and they would come along to the parties. And yeah, we just got into a really nice posse. Um, and then I started getting dragged into doing stuff at horseplay <laughs> as a performer. <laughs> what were you doing? Well, um, they, I come out of a, a relationship. I was really broken by this relationship and I kind of threw myself into just having fun and going out. And uh, they put on a they put on a night, which is I think probably one of the best nights I've ever gone out to, um, which was called Horseplay Goes Cruising, and it was based on the film Cruising. Have you seen um, Robert? Not Robert De Niro. Um, Al Pacino. No. Al Pacino. Yeah. That's it. Al Pacino. And uh, so that was shown at the Cube Cinema in the afternoon. And then that evening, Horseplay Goes Cruising was on. And the dress was Leatherman Club type thing. <laughs> and uh, I'd never done anything like that before. So in the weeks running up to it, I'd started ordering, ordering all this stuff off eBay. It's expensive. Well, it was the costume stuff I was buying. I wasn't buying the... But you were buying pleather, right? Pleather, yeah. yeah. Good, good. So um, at that point. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I think it was about the week before uh, I went. So wait, hang on. Is this whole conversation, I just realized I was into leather. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay, carry on, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, but uh, I think I'd done something else to them before where I played an immersive character at an event called The Storm. Uh, unfortunately, my ex, who we just split up with, was also performing that night. So oh, it was a bit of that's a weird fun, night yeah. for me. And I ended up going home and I didn't really enjoy it. But Horseplay Goes Cruising was next. And um, there was a lot of talk about it. We have a little a kind of um, Facebook friend group. Uh, and we're all talking about what we're going to wear. And the great thing about that night is every, I think everybody apart from two people dressed up. I would have been one of those two people. I have to, would you? I have to say. <laughs> well, I tell you what, everybody else had such a ball. Um, hey, we're and, going all of it. Okay, so you were performing. What were you performing? Um, well, I, the thing is that I wasn't <laughs> meant to be performing that night. <laughs> is this an impromptu striptease? The, well, <laughs> we'll get there. So um, anyway, the week running up to, to this thing, I, I started buying this stuff and it would slowly come in and i one night i just thought oh, i'm gonna just put this stuff on yeah of course see what it looks like you know so i had this pair of uh, a nice pair of big boots a pair of pleather trousers and like a crossover harness you know i'm not i'm a i'm a big guy i'm not used to taking my top off uh in public and uh and a hat and some dark glasses. I put all this stuff on and I suddenly looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, oh, wow. I suddenly felt really empowered and like I wasn't myself, even though I was myself, but I felt like I could do all sorts of stuff dressed up like that. And that I that normal Bernie would not do. And... Um, I'm going to need some examples. Well, what kind of stuff? <laughs> well, I just didn't think that I was a leather queen or into any of that kind of, in, into kink at all. But suddenly I was like, this looks really good on me. This is making me feel really good and very sexual. And I don't normally feel like that. So ah. you know, this is this is something that I need to explore. So anyway. you'd never seen like images of other men in leather and thought, Hmm, I want to give that a try. I'd, I'd seen other images of men in leather, but I didn't think that was ever going to be me. What? So, so it didn't turn you on or you thought that that couldn't be you because you didn't fit the archetype. I don't think it even crossed my mind ah. at that point. And yeah, so then a, fr a friend of mine came over, um, as I only live around the corner from the club, and we got ready, and he was meant to be a podium dancer that night, and he was a podium dancer that night. 
And I said, oh, what what are you going to do? And he said, I've got out this massive dildo and went, I'm going to do death by dildo. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. He said, I'm going to get out there and dance and then I'm going to kill myself with the dildo and make all of this fake cum go, come all over me at, like blood. Oh, oh, that's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And <laughs> I was like, okay, that, that sounds great. You know, um, <laughs> good on you. Uh, anyway, so we we go to the club, and uh, I didn't know what it was going to be like. I was a bit scared of taking my my jacket off. Obviously, I just have this harness on. Oh, okay. And just quick side note: Did you have to sit through the whole film wearing your harness? No, the, <laughs> the, the film was on in the afternoon, and I'd already watched it a few months before, so I didn't go to. That. Okay, all right, okay, all right. So you're in the club. I, you got your jacket on. Um, <laughs> Hey, and it took a lot of preparation. I mean, I needed a bit of fake tan on this body <gasps> before I was exposing it. So, no. <laughs> well, it was uh, it was about this time of year, so you know there was no. Yeah, but like it was a bit pasty white. So okay, so sorry. I'm bringing my own thing to this. Don't listen to me. So you had your jacket on. You were in the club. You were afraid to take it off, but well, every, but everybody else was taking theirs off, so I took mine off, I, and I ended up so. Um, John Thomas, who's a porn star who we've had on as a guest, um, it was one the first night I met him because he was dressed up as a gimp and I was told to look after him by Bronco or Pony or Jim Carner who were running the event. And were you given any more instructions than that? No, I was just I, I was just looking after him for an hour. So um, and it, it, he literally just had like a face mask on and not very much else. Um, but so no again, leash the, on a leash okay, yeah right. it's important i can visualize this <laughs> yeah i was just making sure it was okay but then you know you've got to think that everybody in this club is dressed up like they're in a leather bar in the 19 in 1970s new york now i've never experienced that in my life and the thing is because it wasn't a fetish night it was so much fun because it wasn't you, there wasn't an overt thing that it was sexual. It was like, we're dressed up in this kind of fetish gear, but it's a club night and we're here to have fun. And it's really, it is sexual because it's pretty hot and raunchy, but um, there's no kind of overt, there's not a dark room. There's not people having sex on the dance floor. Well, not that I saw anyway. Um, but it, So it was just a real fun, titillating vibe. And it was very freeing. Um, and there were podium dancers and it was great, but people didn't recognize who I was. So I'm standing there in like my leather gear and this harness. I'm like people that I know were having a conversation right in front of me and they completely ignoring me. And I would go, hello. <laughs> and they were like, uh, oh, it's you. <laughs> because I don't think anyone expected to ever see me in a, you know, dressed up as a leather man in a club at that point. The other question I had, sorry to just in to interrupt, you said you bought sunglasses. Were you wearing them mm. in the club? Yeah. <laughs> How could you see anything? Well, I mean, yeah. My eyesight was way better then than it is now. <laughs> Maybe that's why they didn't recognize you as well. Sorry. So, uh, oh, yes. That, I, I mean, probably. Uh, my friend got up and did the podium dancing. And I was dancing near him and he grabbed me and I ended up dancing on the podium with him. And then he ended up killing me with the dildo. <laughs> As you do, yeah. And and then I died with lots of fake cum all over me. Uh, fake cum and, then, and fake tan. Yeah, fake cum, fake tan. <laughs> it was all fake that night. Fake leather. <laughs> uh then he whispers in my ear. Um, so I, he gets me back up and says, I've got 10 more minutes to do. Take your trousers off. <gasps> <laughs> so I then end up dancing on this podium just to jock. Oh, I thought and, the dildo uh, was still in the story. Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the dildo didn't get inserted. Anywhere. 
<laughs> I was like, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Just raunchy dancing in a jock on a podium, which I, I wasn't expecting to be do, doing that night. But then the rest of the night was just so much fun. It was, I remember walking into the the bar area, which was like a separate dance area, and they were just playing 70s disco. And it's just full of guys in, you know, um, harnesses and shorts and, you know, mm. um, and jocks that it was just so much fun because just everyone was just having a ball and dancing. Um, let's talk about the that feeling of liberation mm. again. So up until this point, you hadn't been to any, like, sex clubs or stuff like that where you got naked not really no um i i've been to kind of um i've been to gran canaria and bars where (laughs) stuff went on obviously in dark rooms and stuff but i never really that wasn't my thing i didn't i didn't go in and do that so this was yeah it was kind of like liberating for me sexually and so can you describe that feeling before you took your coat off what was going through your mind i th- i think i already knew what was i knew how i was going to feel that night because i felt it already when i looked at myself in the mirror and beforehand with the stuff on and it was just i mean but one of the reasons i think one of the reasons why i used to love acting was because I wasn't very comfortable in being me Mm. and I thought if I was somebody else I was more comfortable playing somebody else rather than me and this this felt like I was playing a separate character to me and this character could be a way freer with their um their kinky side and their um sexuality than I ever had done before so it was it was quite a revelation. Mm. And obviously I've incorporated that into my life ever since. <laughs> so so it like changed you. The club changed you forever. Totally. Totally changed me. And so are you able to attribute that to like age or to the um environment in the club or a third thing that I can't think of or was it just like all of these things melded together well being an actor I think I can do pretty much anything and you when you do actor training you end up getting your kit off at some point anyway they said that was the training but it wasn't the training (laughs) can I do I show you on dolly where they touch (laughs) Um, oh no we shouldn't make a joke of this sorry um (laughs) um so a lot of the stuff I was doing at that time as a performer, I mean, I was di- I'd was done queer movies which had a kind of sexual aspect to it. And I'd actually played a sex shop owner who was also a bit of a, uh, he was a cross-dresser. Um, he liked dressing up in all sorts of gear, including the, the rubber stuff as well. Um, oh, and so the rubber and, didn't, didn't unleash anything in you? The rubber didn't, no. It was oh. more the... It was more the leather or the pleather uh-huh. that was that was uh, doing it for me, and I think I just I'd also been very safe. I, you know, I was seen as this very prim, proper person who ran a professional networking night. What? But so was it that you were seen as that, or you saw yourself as that? Well, po- yeah, probably a, a bit of both, and I I just wanted to break free of uh-huh. that. And and be more me, which is a little bit, you, you know. Um, I'm, I mean, I come from a working class background, you know, and I, uh, I'm not prim and proper by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but isn't isn't it like isn't it fascinating um, by wearing other clothes that you wouldn't normally wear, you become more you. Yeah, totally by wearing a costume it almost allows you to be more you i find that really Um, fascinating because it's kind of because you're hiding behind it in a way so you feel less vulnerable yeah yeah because you're kind of trying yourself on Mm. or trying a facet of yourself on which perhaps you haven't explored before and also i again i think i found it i think i found it quite liberating along with the the leather stuff because i've had kind of uh body dysmorphia all of my life I've never been I I mean I was told when I was younger that I was big or I was ugly or this that and the other and you know looking back I know I wasn't but Mm -hmm. when you're told that repeatedly you it sinks in 
And uh, so I was never confident with my body, particularly as I got older and bigger. And, um, and I think I found that quite liberating as well, because obviously I, you know, I'm not comfortable in my, my own skin to a certain degree. And so I felt like I needed to do it and that needed to kind of overcome a, a boundary. Mm. So yeah, so this this club just kind of set me free in so many ways. And so many other people as well. It was just, it, it really built a community um, of queer people in Bristol and, and good friends. Um, so the world opened up for you. You had a pleather harness, you had a pleather hat, you had dark sunglasses, pleather trousers, boots. And did you then go on to spend a shit ton of money on other accessories <clears throat> not a shit ton of money but i've a spent a bit money. of money on... <laughs> <laughs> i think this is the reason that i i like never get into any kinks because i'm always like oh i'll have a look and then like what you want 50 pounds for that no no and then i just decide not to bother investigating yeah well it was kind of so i had like this kind of costume harness which i'd bought for um horseplay and I was hooking up with guys on Grinder, and they would obviously see the picture of me in this high harness, and some of them would want me to wear the harness. But because it's so flimsy, if you pull on it, it just comes off immediately. So I had to invest in a better harness. And now I think I have five. <laughs> so... <laughs> like different colored ones? Or like why? Yeah, like just why? Kind of... <laughs> I don't know. I think it's kind of... Yeah. I mean, like, it's not like one is going to be in the wash. You can just, like, wipe it down. <laughs> well, I couldn't decide what I liked, so I ended up just buying five. <laughs> oh, That's including the original flimsy one. Once I decided um, I was going to, like, buy a jock strap, and then I went to the shop and I couldn't decide what colour, so I just bought one in every colour, but I bought the wrong size. So I had, like, five that I couldn't wear. <laughs> I think I might still have yeah. them, actually. Sell them on eBay. Oh, like soiled. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if anyone wants one, get in touch. Um... <laughs> You're looking for some funding for the podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are my Patreon perks. <laughs> uh, but what I think what I really want to say is that what, what was the most fun um, was probably the early days when – it was like 1 a.m. on a Friday, well, Saturday morning, and you're dancing to like some electro disco vibe. You can't see anything in front of you because there's dry ice everywhere. And it's just great fun. <laughs> well, it's, it's fun because you can't see anything, or that's just like happens to be. <laughs> no, it's just because you're there in the moment and dancing and it's free. You know, you're, you're just. Bit, Part, I think part of dancing in that smog um, of dry ice is very freeing because you're not self-conscious because you can't see anybody else and they can't see you, so you can just do whatever you like. Oh, you know where my mind went then. And I'm sure there were lots of other things that went on in that dry yeah. ice room as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, but that is wonderful when when the, the yeah. space is created in such a way that you're not self-conscious about dancing. Um because you can't say oh. bloody thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the weird thing is, is dry ice has become a thing of the past, I think, because... Oh, what? Is it? Oh, is it carcinogenic? Am I going to die? Yeah, well, I think it just sets off fire alarms all the time, doesn't it? Smokes oh, does it? Oh. Yeah, unfortunately. But I love, I love a room full of dry ice. It does smell gross. I quite like that smell. There's something about it that I like. It's like there in the back of your throat. Like it's, mm, no. Yeah, I think you and I are very different beasts when it comes to gay. <laughs> when it comes to gay? Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to being gay, you what and I... What does that really, mean? <laughs> I don't know. Because <laughs> I don't like dry eyes. Love and you I'm, hate. Su I'm suddenly on your shit list. <laughs> no, not at all. No, that's the thing. It's, we're, we're all accepting of each other. I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's a dichotomy here on a number of subjects. <laughs> oh, wait, what? What else was there? You don't like hugging. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we're different They're gays. like dry eyes. <laughs> I'm get, there's a pattern appearing here. I'm getting a picture of who you are. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I think I've represented myself fairly this evening. <laughs> did you ever go to horseplay? Well, if you did, I would love to hear from you. Find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook with the username K Anderson Music and let me know what you got up to. And if you have any photos, including pictures of Bernie on a podium, then do share them. And whilst you're at it, go and give Bernie some love. You can find him on Twitter with the username Bernie Hodges. And on top of that, make sure you give a listen to the What That Old Queen podcast, which is available on all good streaming platforms like this one you're using right now. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I've been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there, and will be releasing songs over the coming year. You can hear the first single, which is called Well Groomed Boys, and is also playing underneath my talking right now, on all good streaming platforms. If you liked this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on Apple Podcasts, or just told someone who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. (laughs) 